ప్రొఫెసర్ మేడం లక్ష్మీ శేషాద్రి డాక్టర్ లక్ష్మీ ఎస్ అండ్ ఇట్స్ క్వైట్ అన్ఫార్చునేట్ దట్ జస్టిస్ హాఫ్ మేయర్ సార్ కుడ్ నాట్ జాయిన్ అస్ అండ్ ఐఎమ్ హియర్ ఆన్ బిహాఫ్ ఆఫ్ శేఖరన్ సార్ ఎస్ లీ డిస్కసెంట్ వీల్ గో స్ట్రేట్ ఇన్ టు ద టాపిక్ ఆఫ్ హైపర్ టెన్షన్ అండ్ ఐ విల్ బీ అడ్రెస్సింగ్ లక్ష్మీ శేషాద్రి మేడం యాజ్ మేడం అండ్ లక్ష్మీ యాజ్ లక్ష్మీ బికాస్ షీ వాజ్ మై ఓన్ జూనియర్ కొలీగ్ to make things easy because both are lakshmis so as of all of you know hypertension ranks second in causing severe maternal morbidity and mortality next to hemorrhage and the leading cause of death is cerebral hemorrhage more than 50% of the women die of cerebral complications and that means hypertension has to be controlled and early recognition and control of blood pressure may prevent such drastic complications So my first question will be to Lakshmi what should be the threshold for starting antihypertensive therapy in hypertension detected during pregnancy and uh, what should be the target what are the benefits just highlight on that so as you have already mentioned about 10% of maternal deaths in our state is contributed by hypertensive disorders and in this about 50% of them die due to cerebral hemorrhage due to acute on acute severe hypertension so it's mandatory that we have a stringent control over the blood pressure and a uh, bp of 140 over 90 early um, uh, new onset hypertension of 140 90 uh, with or without uh, proteinuria and uh, um, end organ damage is said to be preeclampsia and so a uh, bp uh, control of uh, hypertension should be b- below 140 over 90 and uh, the target should be anything just below that to the tune of 130, 120 to 130 systolic and uh, 85 diastolic. So by definition, if we find gestational hypertension or even chronic hypertension and blood pressure is equal to a more than 140-90, that is an indication for starting antihypertensive Can therapy. Can I make a comment here? Yes, madam. Um, until recently, the um, um, ACOG and the other guidelines kept saying, wait till the blood pressure is 160 over 110 before yes. you start antihypertensives. But even at that time, in the previous guidelines, WHO has said, when the blood pressure is over 150 over 100, you can start, especially in developing countries where the women may not recognize the symptoms immediately and may not come very immediately for follow-up. And they called it a moderate hypertension. But now, currently following the two trials, I'm sure which the chips yes. and the chops, everybody is aware and the guidelines have changed and people have now categorically yes, said. Yes, and the classification of severe and non-severe hypertension actually doesn't stand because uh, yeah. non-severe hypertension can any time become, become a, a severe. severe hypertension. So we have to bring down the blood pressure once it is above 140 over 90. So what are the benefits, Lakshmi? Yeah, definitely, uh, as we said, uh, it definitely brings down the incidence of cerebral hemorrhages, other maternal complications like acute pulmonary edema, and also the fetal problems of abruption and uh, 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 iatrogenic preterm births also will be brought down. Now uh, we have enough associated evidence, with, isn't it? Yeah, associated with uh, injury to the other target organs like the liver and the kidney. Okay. So the American Heart Association also endorses this and especially in uh, under-resourced countries, we need to uh, start antihypertensive treatment early. But this has not been actually accepted by many of the professional bodies. But most of them are uh, actually now coming forward to start antihypertensive therapy the, early. The worry was um, whether the blood pressure would be brought down too much, yes. thereby interfering with the placental circulation. So the target blood pressure is important. Mm-hmm. Don't bring it down to less than 130 and keep the diastolic around 80 to 85. I think that would be fine. Yeah. yeah. So the evidence brought by this CHIP study, which is tight versus less tight control of diastolic blood pressure and also the chronic hypertension and pregnancy trial has brought out this point and now uh, it is clear that we need to start antihypertensive therapy early. Now we'll discuss some uh, case scenarios related to hypertension. A case of early onset preeclampsia at 32 weeks with growth restricted fetus, growth of 28 weeks, blood pressure 150 over 100. She's on nifedipine, 10 milligram twice daily, umbilical artery Doppler shows absent and diastolic flow. Uh, madam, would you like to take that? Well, uh, you have a double trouble here. Yes. She's got uh, severe early onset preeclampsia. 
and also early onset growth restriction, which is normally associated with the um, hypertensive uh, disorder. So we need to evaluate the mother first, and yes. I, we would need to find out the severity, protein, what is the amount of proteinuria, what is the liver function test, what are the cre um, renal functions like a creatinine, platelets, etc., and then basically uh, evaluate the mother and decide on the severity. The blood pressure has not reached the target level. She's only on 10 milligram nephidipin, so you could increase the dose and bring the BP down. You have to simultaneously evaluate the fetus. And here you have a fetus with an early onset uh, fetal growth restriction, which was uh, discussed in great detail uh, yesterday. And a fetus, she, the uterus looks around 28 weeks. I suppose it's about 900 grams to a kilo. Uh, we do not know the severity of the growth restriction, so we need to evaluate that. You need an ultrasonography to find out whether, what percentile it is. Is it less than the third centile, less than the tenth centile? And um, the Doppler is already showing an absent diastolic flow. And uh, therefore, I think the progression can be pretty rapid if it has already reached this level. And uh, therefore, I would start her on steroids immediately. Yes, yes. I would in Joy addition was telling this yeah. is one indication where prophylactic steroids should be given. And in addition to ch doing all this, I will do a CTG. That will tell us how far the baby is gone. And of course, uh, the amniotic fluid volume, along with uh, the Doppler, and administer the uh, steroids. I do not give, I won't give her Maxer because she's 32 weeks already. And I will plan to deliver her, basically, as soon as the steroid cover is over. We'll monitor with, NS, CTG. with CTG and uh, biophysical profile, and of course. And at this point, but, uh, actually, the termination is also uh, may not be uh, easy. And of course, cervix will be unfavorable. So yes, the mode of delivery has to be Certainly. She's primary at 32 weeks. Yeah. The cervix is, and got an absent diastolic flow. The, this fetus may not withstand the stress of yeah, labor, the whether there's become a reversal in the next 48 hours, we don't know. So most probably would be a cesarean Cesarity. section, yes, in all probability. Okay, the next case, a primary at 33 weeks, presents with generalized malaise and upper abdominal pain. Blood pressure is 150 over 100. The uterus is 32 weeks, fetal heart is good. What is the clinical uh, suspicion? And to add on top of that, her platelet count is 60,000. AST 280, ALT 300, LDH 1200. And would you like to have some other investigations or uh, uh, what is your clinical impression? How do you manage, Lakshmi? Yeah. Uh, from the clinical picture, this is very uh, typical of a complete uh, uh, health syndrome yes. because uh, she has a low platelet count, elevation of the liver enzymes, LDH is elevated. Uh, the other investigations uh, would uh, be the renal function test. A peripheral smear would be uh, helpful because it would show schistocytes. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, in about uh, 15 to 25 percent, there may be no proteinuria and uh, hypertension may also yes, be absent. At present, even so, in the absence of hypertension, you may sometimes have, have to, to di yeah. diagnose health syndrome. And this is indeed a very severe form of uh, preeclampsia. Uh, so, uh, this patient uh, and help uh, is a medical emergency and there is no conservatism uh, to be followed here. This patient uh, needs to be uh, delivered immediately once uh, her um, um, blood parameters are uh, taken care of, uh, she has to be stabilized because this can lead to progressive deterioration. Yes, she can lead to DIC, <coughs> pulmonary edema. Acute, kidney, Acute injury. kidney injury, and especially when a patient presents with abdominal pain, you have to think of hepatic hematoma, yeah. rupture, and all that. So this is one situation where we should be looking for it whenever a patient presents with hypertension and terminate early. Early. Is there a role for conservative management, Lakshmi? Uh, uh, of course, uh, if there are no pressing indications like, uh, as we mentioned, uh, persistent severe hypertension, acute pulmonary edema, acute kidney injury, we could uh, take about uh, 24 to 48 hours uh, to uh, give steroids. Uh, yes, and, just for the sake just of the for baby. Just for the sake of, uh, sake of the baby, and then take immediate measures to deliver her. But uh, most of them uh, would be uh, would be preterm, so the cervix is also expected uh, to be yeah. less favorable, which would uh, make the likelihood of uh, cesarean section yes, high. Yes, definitely. So the cervix might be unfavorable. No time for a prolonged induction. So cesarean actually, the, there are certain precautions to be taken when you. 
do a cesarean. Chagrin, sir, you want to say something? No, this patient may have coagulation problem also. So, you have to be careful about that management of uh, DIC and other things. So, you have to be ready with platelet transfusions, plasma and other things also to be thought of because uh, her platelet was 60,000 or so. You can do a cesarean with 50 and above, but uh, she may go in for DIC. So, be on the lookout of those complications also. As you said, it's a medical emergency. There's no place for conservatism. You have to stabilize the patient by improving her plate count if necessary and keep everything ready and probably in this case she will go in for a cesarean. So, it's an absolute indication for termination once you have made a diagnosis like this and of course with the backup services for meeting that eventuality of DIC and other things. And uh, as you said, it's a medical emergency, it's the only termination that is the definitive treatment in this condition. So, we have brought out everything but also look for the DIC problem also. But and because she is prone for DIC, it's better to put a vert vertical incision. incision. And also sometimes uh, we need to inspect the liver also because we have found out in uh, situations where bleeding was coming inside the abdomen, <laughs> you have taken out the baby and then we have found a rupture of the liver, hematoma of the liver. So we have to inspect the liver too and always liver drain because she is susceptible to DIC. The platelet count of 60,000 is actually borderline. I mean, yes, they yes. say 50 is all right, they may not bleed, it is a little more than 50, but then who is to say it is absolutely 60,000 or not? I would certainly repeat the platelet count before I take her for a section and I will probably transfuse her at least two units of platelet rich concentrates before I actually take because her and keep some in reserve because they could bleed at the time of cesarean section and that's something that we need to be certainly worried about. No regional anesthesia. So, there are some other conditions also which might present in the same manner. So, I think we need to exclude all these things, isn't it? Yeah. Acute fatty liver of pregnancy, TTP, a hemolytic uremic syndrome. So, we need to have uh, the specialists also involved to find out what is what. Idiopathic thrombocytopenic <coughs> purpura and uh, sometimes uh, non-obstetric causes like acute cholecystitis and things also can present with upper abdominal pain. So. But in a patient of. with the yeah, hypertension, hypertension and if she has yeah. about additional proteinuria, then I my first diagnosis would be yeah, yeah. help. And I think is always the, helps many of them are more <laughs> like a theoretical differential diagnosis. I could think of an acute fatty liver, but her enzymes, uh, um, and yes. of course, I mean enzymes may not be very grossly elevated. Yes. She's not jaundiced. So when you do a serum bilirubin, that will tell you. And of course, you could do a um, um, blood count to do if she's got a leukocytosis. That would be my only. Uh, different diagnosis, really. The yes. rest, yes, are there on the list, but basically at the back of my mind. Also, the blood sugar. In yes, blood sugar. Yes, hypoglycemia. hypoglycemia. Yes. In yes, certainly. Now, we go to the case number three, a primary at 34 weeks pregnancy, brought to the casualty with severe persistent headache, blood pressure 180 over 120, suddenly she develops generalized convulsions. So, how will you provide the immediate care? What is the anti-convulsant? Which antihypertensive to be given? when and how to terminate the pregnancy. So, this is another real emergency which has to be tackled. So, uh, Lakshmi, can you just start? Yeah. First and foremost. <laughs> what? Lakshmi? Yeah, Lakshmi, Lakshmi. I'll call you only madam. <laughs> Lakshmi the junior. Yes, junior. <laughs> First and foremost, it's in, because she's come, come with convulsions, it's important to stabilize the mother. Uh, like uh, securing her airway uh, and um, avoiding a fall and uh, preventing yeah, uh, injury yes. to the mother. Uh, securing an IV line is very important. And uh, also simultaneously uh, uh, taking measures to control the convulsions and uh, bringing down the blood pressure because the BP is 180, 120. So um, uh, a magnesium sulfate uh, regime has to be started. Along with, uh, I would prefer to give uh, intravenous levetilol because uh, her BP is 180 over 120, 20 milligram uh, IV. I think the levetilol first, isn't it? Yeah. Because we would like because, to bring yeah. down the blood because pressure Because the hypertension first to has to come down first. Yeah. Uh, and simultaneously starting magnesium sulfate. Uh, I would give a loading dose of uh, 4 gram uh, diluted in, in di 4 gram in 100 ml of normal saline. Uh, in 15 to 20 minutes, along with uh, 2 gram in each buttock, uh, 
amounting to Total eight gram. loading dose of eight. Eight gram. Yes. Loading and dose. And you are talking about the KFOG regime. Yeah, what this is the KFOG here? regime which we are following right now. Madam, you have something else to say, or do you follow the Not same really. regime? Not really. I think. Uh, uh, we also use a loading dose followed by maintenance dose of uh, one gram per hour. I agree with you. And um, the what the key word here is simultaneously. Yes. I don't think these are done one after the other. You need to put in the cannula, draw blood, and then start the, that maximum loading doses, irrespective of any anything else, renal status or output or whatever. Yes, yes. Immediately, all of us know, I think from the time of yeah, Mudiliar yeah. days, we know that all these proceed simultaneously, and that is what is important here. And, and that's what I, what I want to stress also upon. ready, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. One word about this regime. If you follow that IV regime, which is uh, normally done, there is a recurrence of fits in about 10 percent of cases. Yeah. That's why, and the blood level reached by this loading dose of 4 gram is not sufficient to prevent a fit, which is maybe around 4 milli equivalent per liter, and maybe below that. That's why we added this 4 gram additionally than the IV regime which is recommended. So this, after this, we had only one, just one case of recurrence of fits after this over the so many years. So we are very satisfied with this loading dose of 8 gram. You know, when the IM regime is there, we are given 12 grams as a loading dose. 4 gram IV and 4 gram on each buttock, that is 12 gram. And the blood level may be sufficient to prevent a fit. As you said, the next fit may not kill the patient, but it is important to prevent the recurrence. Also, you are always stressing that control of the blood pressure simultaneously or first while we are preparing for the magnesium sulfate solution, I will prefer to give away 20 milligrams of IV labetalol to bring down the BP because we have seen that 48 percent to be exact of the death due to eclampsia is due to cerebral hemorrhage. So that is where we have to be very careful in bringing down the blood pressure immediately by giving the IV dose of labetalol. So you have stressed it enough and more give the antihypertensive simultaneously while prefer first drug to be given in this situation is IV labetalol followed by magnesium sulfate. That is a stressing once again the control of blood pressure is most important in this case. One reason uh, why the convulsions recur in a patient while she is on magnesium sulfate is that she could be an obese patient when this particular loading dose may not bring, bring up the uh, magnesium sulfate to therapeutic levels. So an additional 2 gram uh, IV uh, in 15 to yeah. 20 minutes if, can be given. If the convulsions recur immediately, and you the maintenance you dose use is, a 2 gram. Uh, yeah. Actually, 1 gram per hour, we usually give it by an yes, infusion pump yeah. Yeah. rather than IM. Yeah, by an infusion pump. And labetalol can also be given as infusion, 200 milligram added to 80 ml of normal saline and given at a rate of 2 milligram per minute. And the, uh, if uh, labetalol is not available like in a periphery, you can Even also oral give, nifidipin, yeah, oral nifidipin yeah. which also brings down the blood pressure in 15 to 20 minutes. And the immediately acting drug has to be given, not the sustained release. No one. sustained. Yes. That's something to be remembered that here. we should not use a sustained uh, release yes. at this kind of situation. Yes. Now, every labor room should be equipped with a box like this, an eclampsia box with all the necessary equipments. We don't have to run about for each and every one. And because of lack of time, I'm just rushing. And um, in hypertensive uh, pregnancies, actually, when we decide termination, the cervix will be unfavorable, and we cannot go for a prolonged induction. And if possible, if the cervix is favorable, you can allow a vaginal delivery. Anyway, uh, no prolonged labor and close monitoring of blood pressure is very important. Uterine contractions can predispose to a high blood pressure. The patient remaining comatose. What is your take on that, Lakshmi? Yeah, I would definitely think of an, an intracerebral uh, accident uh, and uh, would suspect a cerebral bleed and subject her to uh, an MRI. And, yeah, uh, we need to have the neurologist also, also to Also to be involved yes. in this. Okay. And um, also we should remember the press, which is the reversible encephalopathy, which can also be seen. And uh, that is actually treatable. So postpartum care is also very important, isn't Extremely. it? Postpartum control of hypertension. Madam, would you like to tell us yeah. that? Yeah, just to say that do not send away these women without antihypertensives. Most of them will require, unless the blood pressure really comes crashing down to normal before you discharge, they are going to require antihypertensives and follow-up. 
uh, it might come down to normal in six or eight weeks time, but till then the antihypertensives must be uh, continued and that is important. And also I mean, thromboprophylaxis, yeah. especially <coughs> after a cesarean section. A word, I, uh, one point I would like to add here is, uh, especially if the, if the patient has had uh, atypical features uh, while uh, the cerebral events, one should also suspect uh, an intracerebral bleed and uh, should exercise caution in starting uh, inoxaparin because recently we had a patient who actually had a subarachnoid bleed and she was already started on inoxaparin which later had to be stopped. Okay. For lack of time, I am skipping prediction and prevention. Uh, I am, uh, because um, Hofmeier sir could not come, he has actually put some uh, uh, thoughts on calcium prophylaxis. Ambija, WHO, madam, you can take two more minutes. Two more minutes. Okay, then uh, uh, how do you predict preeclampsia, madam? Is there any role? Will you like to screen every woman well, for that? Uh, whether, uh, I think um, in this day and age, all or almost all our women have um, first trimester ultrasonography. The most important thing in prediction is a history. You need to see whether the patient has high risk factors or not and that, that really, in fact even prophylaxis uh, aspirin is based on the history and um, presence of other comorbidities like diabetes and etc. etc. Now uh, we are all doing, and it's not very difficult to uh, get the mean arterial pressure. We are all doing the first trimester ultrasound scan and therefore the 11 to 14 week scan, you could do a uterine artery Doppler. Uh, and if you're doing the double marker, um, I think in addition, if you, especially if there's a PLGF, I think all these put together will give you a decent, the sensitivity of this combination of history, uh, mean arterial pressure, uterine artery Doppler and the placental growth factor. This, the sensitivity is fairly good in about 90% and therefore, might be a, a good thing to do. It certainly hasn't come as a routine because PLGF and others are not available everywhere. Mean arterial pressure, history are very easy. Uterine artery Doppler, everyone does. And so if this can be incorporated, it would be good. Has not come and as a, has a routine recommendation. Okay. You can, people do PLGF much later in pregnancy when there is a mild hypertension. You want to know whether is it going to become preeclampsia and that to predict that or even do the SFLT1 PLGF ratio to see whether in the in the later part of pregnancy in the third trimester those are not predictions i think this combination has been recommended by some professional bodies but it's not come as a routine but yes in our country it would be a good thing to do especially in women who have high risk factor and of course start them on aspirin if there are high risk factors i would start on aspirin without waiting for any of this. so these are the take home messages start antihypertensives if the blood pressure is equal to or more than 140 over 90, investigate to assess the severity of hypertension, monitor the fetus, manage acute hypertensive crisis, always use magnesium sulfate as the drug of first choice, and optimal time for termination of pregnancy should be chosen. So close monitoring is very, very important. And do not forget to under, uh, uh, advise postpartum monitoring also. And give antihypertensives if the blood pressure is more than 140 over 90. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Lakshmi, ma'am. And Thank you. Lakshmi, Shagran, sir, Riley, sir. And this topic is very close to Shagran, sir. So he has chosen all these areas of interest. And I think we have covered almost. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambuja, madam. And both Lakshmi, madams. Thank you. Now, there is a small change in the program. Instead of the discussion, uh, we are moving on to innovations by Dr. Hofmeyer. And though physically he couldn't be here, he, he is there live now online. Uh, he has been waiting for his session. So we are moving on to. Sir, good morning. Can you hear us? Good morning. Sir, this is a full hall. And they were so sad that you were not here for the past two days. We are so happy to see you here. I, I presume it is quite early morning there in your place, isn't it, sir? It is, but it's lovely to be here with you. Thank you. Sir, good morning. So over to Pili, sir, to start this session. Hi, Justice. Hi. Hi. Yeah. We very much wanted you here. All the programs had you as a discussant, but unfortunately, uh, it didn't materialize. Let's not worry much about it. At least you can be with us directly to interact with us. 
we always have justice as a close friend as well as participant in our programs and this time also we wanted you here uh, as all of you know you take anything in obstetric literature hofmeier is there you take cochrane hofmeier repeatedly comes and he had visited us many times before directly contributed in our scientific programs and this time also we hoped it will happen but unfortunately did not so we thought we will hear from him what are the leading contributions he has made to obstetrics right from the small innovations to the ones i believe one of your papers is going to appear in new england journal next month is it is it right yes i yeah. mentioned that can you tell us about it which one is that what is it about well this isn't an invention of mine but this is a major trial called the emotive study 